we uh, enter into worship this morning. Lord, I thank you that you're here. I thank you you're in this place. I thank you that we can gather together, Lord, to worship you, to hear from your word, Lord, what a gift that is. Lord, I thank you that uh, you want to speak to us. So open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears to hear from you. Lord, Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak into our lives this morning. God, that you would be lifted up in our singing and our worship, lifted up in our fellowship with one another. And God, that we would experience you here in a new way. In Jesus' name.
the youth rally. It's just the area youth rally, all the churches in our area. And they uh, go to celebrate, and it's at 5.30 to 8. Um, there's going to be some pizza afterwards, so bring a dollar for pizza if you want to be there at any team. Grade 6 to 12, Southgate, 5.30 to 8 tonight. There's a Super Bowl party coming up. Woo! Yeah. Who's in the meat club? First rule of meat club is don't talk about the meat club. Don't talk about meat club. All right, meat club is for any lads, guys, whatever that want to come. Uh, next Sunday night, bring a bowl of meat and watch the game here at Cornerstone at 6. Um, also, just a reminder that there's prayer group happening, prayer warriors meet on Tuesdays from 7 to 8 in the lounge, as well as Cornerstone Kids is our Tuesday nights from 6 to 7.30. Yeah, Charlotte's excited about that. Awesome. Um, uh, if you're interested in membership and baptism, please speak to Stacy in the yeah, office. Yeah, I'm excited about membership. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, don't forget, there's a potluck lunch last Sunday of the month. So potluck lunch on February 26th. And if you can please, if you're interested or you can help in setting up and cleaning up, please speak to Leslie. Leslie, just give a wave. She's at the back door there. She's your uh, welcome room this morning. So if you speak to her, she just needs some help with setting up tables and chairs and putting the food out and then also after to clean up and do dishes and stuff like that. Um, and it was gonna do, we're going to do a service, or there's a couple of us going to Southbridge, which is the long-term care center in Kempville. And the Bayfield Manor, um, on also that Sunday, the 26th, from 2 and 2.30, and um, doing a worship service. So if you'd like to join uh, this kind of team to go and visit some of the, the folks there, then please speak to Dan as well. Let's continue in worship. Let's stand together. <laughs> you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. The fact. 
me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock. Be my rock of refuge. A strong fortress. A strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. For the sake of your name, lead and guide me.
we're going to keep the kids in for a little bit longer. Well, first we'll do uh, our communion. I, uh, I really love these words that, it, that, um, that uh, start off that song that says, Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your breath. I've sang my own song. Verse 2, Lord, I confess I, I've been the prodigal made for your house but walked my own, path, own, my, walked my own roads. Then Jesus came and tore down my prison walls. And that's what we're... Um, we're remembering now. We're 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 remembering the, you know, the cost of our sin, and we're remembering that what Jesus did on the cross was not light or easy, but he walked this world um, as a human, um, all man and all God, so that he could die as the only person uh, and pay for our sins and break down the prison walls and set us free. That's what we're about to remember. And so, uh, you, know, you know, I think it's, it's, it's great that if you, if you at this moment have these sins that you know are on your mind, that you know that maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is um, you know, pointing out to you and he's saying that here are these things that you've had going on, that you've allowed to seep into your life, or to take hold, or to fester. This is a great moment where you can confess and just say, Lord, I know that I've been a criminal. I know that I've not lived my life in a way that is, uh, you know, honoring you. Um, and maybe you're someone who has, who, has, who has been hurt at the hands of someone who has been a criminal, you know, in that sense, and that someone has hurt you, and that, and, and those feelings and those experiences are still unresolved. This is the moment where you can also bring this to your heavenly Father, who loves you, and uh, he's he, he's here, ready to meet you um, as we sit down at the meal table with him. So, why don't I start with a word of prayer, Lord Jesus? We thank you that. Though our sins are as scarlet, you make them as white as snow when we come to you in repentance. And so, Lord God, we don't hold back. Uh, we know, Lord God, that sometimes it's easier to just hide those sins and hide those brokennesses inside our lives, Lord. But, Lord, true freedom, true liberty only comes when we confess, when we tell you what you already know. And so, Lord God, I, I just lift up to you, um, my brothers and sisters, and me, Lord God, as we make our confession, as we say, Lord God, that I've been a criminal, that I've wandered my own roads. But, Lord God, we want to come home. We want to have our homecoming. Lord, so I pray that, uh, Lord, that you would speak, that you would highlight, that you would show, that you would make it clear what are these things. And friends, if there's something that you have to confess, just whisper it to him now. Just whisper it as a word that represents that, that, uh, that whole situation, that whole scenario, that thing that you have to confess. Just whisper it to him and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for wandering my own way. I'm sorry for leaving you, Lord. I'm sorry for striking out in my anger and my lust and my jealousy, and my self-loathing or my self-love. I'm sorry, Lord, that, that you have been supplanted as the king of my heart. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. Just whisper it to him. He sees, he knows anyway. He sees and he knows and he loves you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It says in the Bible, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in the hope 
of the glory of God. We boast in the hope of the glory of God because we stand in his grace that we've accessed through faith. That's from the book of Romans. So, brothers and sisters, you who are walking in fellowship with God and are in love and harmony with your neighbours, and you who do sincerely repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from this time in his holy ways, draw near with faith. Okay, don't draw near with your own list of self-righteousness. That's not how we draw near. We draw near in faith. In faith that Jesus has done everything necessary to make us righteous in the eyes of holy God. So draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to almighty God. Let's pray. O God of grace and mercy, we thank you that you ever loved us and provided for our our redemption. We thank you for your Son who died to save us and for your Spirit who invites us to draw near. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that even now you're in this place and you're inviting us to draw near. You're whispering to us saying, press in, draw near, experience the goodness of God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this invitation that you make. Lord, would you guide us now as we commemorate the suffering of our Lord. Help us to remember the cost of our salvation. Help us to commune with you and with each other. And so would you consecrate the bread and the cup which are here prepared, that as we partake of them, we may receive the spiritual benefits of Christ's body and shed blood. In his name we pray. Amen. So if you want to, uh, as I'm reading this, this next prayer, feel free to you know, open the first layer. There are, there are two layers to your, your communion pack. If you don't have a communion pack and you wish to have one, then please raise your hands and we will make sure that you, you get one. But feel free, it'll, it will make a noise and that's okay. And if the kids make a noise, that's okay as well because this is a family meal. So uh, yeah, feel free to open that first layer as I pray this. Our Father, we give thanks for this bread and cup which remind us of your great love for us as expressed in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We draw near with humility and reverence, knowing that in you we will find forgiveness, comfort, hope, and salvation now and forever. Amen. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take it this is my body so friends the body of our lord jesus christ which was given for you preserve your soul and your body unto everlasting life take and eat this remembering that christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving let's eat Then Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, he said unto them. So friends, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's drink. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you made a way. Thank you, Lord. In this moment of quiet and gratitude, let's stand as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Children, you're dismissed. <laughs> like to do uh, just before going into the sermon and we will have the reading in a second now but what I'd like to do uh, yeah before we have the reading is um, is we have a special item of prayer yep turn on my mic that would help thank you Randy yeah we have a, a special item of prayer that was brought to me last night from uh, Linda who's head of our prayer line of our prayer chain and um, Ron uh, some of you might remember but Ron and Karen Goudreau used to come to Cornerstone uh, a number of years ago and uh, they they're in our North Gore community and uh, I'll just read it to you as it's written if that's okay Linda yeah I'll just read it as it is uh, so Ron has asked our church to pray for them. So this is a request that's come to them. He and his mum, Rachel, and his wife, Karen, all, all have COVID. Uh, Karen, which is the wife, uh, went by ambulance yesterday to Kempville Hospital. She could barely walk or talk. She's been suffering with Lewy body dementia for eight years. Um, and so he, here's a bit of history. Ron has cut his work week down to three days a week to look after Karen at home. She requires full-time care, but is unable to go into a long-term care facility because she has violent psychotic outbursts. Ron's 80-year-old mum looks after Karen at home on the days that Ron is working. Ron and Rachel are also physically exhausted. Rachel is the 80-year-old mum, as, as you can imagine, that she'd be physically exhausted. Ron and Karen used to attend our church years ago. Ron used to sing solos, often in church. They both know the Lord, but have been um, away f for a long time. They all need whatever Jesus can provide for them, his peace, his presence, his healing, his strength. Let's offer them all to him, knowing and believing that all things are possible with him and that he can use everything for his glory. Ron has reached the end of his strength. God shows up the most when we accept that we can do nothing more. Uh, Lord Jesus, we release them to you. Teach us how to pray. If you would join with me as, as we pray for Ron and for Karen um, and for Rachel. Lord Jesus, uh, such need, so many layers, um, some of which have been going on for years. And uh, Lord, I... Remember them, Lord. Uh, 
Ron and Karen, Lord, and so we, we, uh, yeah, we can't imagine what it's like to 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 live with this Louis body dementia, Lord. So uh, we ask that uh, right now that you would pour special grace on that family, on Karen as she's in the hospital, and on Ron and on Rachel as they are reeling from this ongoing life of such trial. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them in a way that only you can. We don't have to tell you how to do your job because you've been doing it for thousands of years, Lord God. You know what they need. You know, Lord, that uh, when it when it comes to the end of the day, you are the only one who can meet them at their point of need. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would you would fill her room at the hospital, that you would fill their house right now, Lord God. I pray that that you would give them such a sense that you are with them. Uh, Lord, we, we do ask for a miracle. We do ask for healing. We do ask, Lord, for restoration. Um, Lord, from yeah, COVID, Lord, and uh, also uh, this, this, this long-term health issue that, that Karen's suffering with. Lord, I pray that uh, you, would, you would release them from this and that, Lord God, you would show such grace and mercy. Um, Lord, so we, we, we ask this in faith. We ask this in the name of, of Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, we also recognize that many times you uh, allow us to walk through, um, through hardships, Lord. And when we acknowledge that, it's not a sign of lack of faith. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a recognition of what we read in the Bible, Lord. And so whether you choose to heal her or whether you choose to show up in, a, in an extra potent way at this moment, uh, Lord, would you answer our prayers? And Lord, I just pray for all of my brothers and sisters here who are silently struggling. And there are many, Lord. I know there are many. Lord, would you... Uh, would you be gracious? Would you be merciful, Lord God? Would you meet them at their point of doubt and need and hardship and longing and suffering, Lord God? Would you show up? You can do this. You've been doing it for millennia, Lord. This isn't extraordinary for you. Lord, so show up in each of our situations in a way that would bring you the most glory and would lead us on our journey of sanctification the most. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. So th- thanks for bringing that. And, uh, you know, if, there is, if, there, if you have prayer needs and you want, you know, the body of Christ, you know, to be praying for you, uh, or for someone that you know, make, make sure you... Uh, Get them to say it's okay, and then uh, we would love to pray either here or on a Tuesday evening during our prayer group. Or if you want people to come around and to pray for you at home, then we can arrange that too. Okay, let's uh, have our, our scripture. Our scripture today is found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. Don't think that I came to abolish the laws or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter nor one stroke of the letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, Whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
but whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. I want you to imagine that uh, you're in class, or that we're in class. We're no longer in the sanctuary at Cornerstone, we're in class at school, and uh, our regular teacher isn't there, so a uh, substitute has come in. And of course, everyone loves when a substitute teacher comes in. And so, you know, we're, you know, we're starting to goof off, because isn't that what substitute teachers are for? But this teacher ignores our rising rabble and walks up to the board and he writes on the board his name. And his name is Mr. Christ. M-R-C-H-R-I-S-T. And we're all like, that's a bit of a funny name. Then he turns to us as we're sat at our desks and Mr. Christ, he says this. His lesson starts. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, if you're like me and you're not a scientist and school chemistry is a long distant memory, then it's good to be reminded that salt's makeup is sodium chloride, N-A-C-L. And Wikipedia, among other sources, tells me that sodium chloride is extremely stable and cannot lose its flavor. So here's the thing. Either Mr. Christ forgot to gen up on his chemistry before teaching this class, or he's making a point. Either way, Mr. Christ now has our attention. After his lesson on the chemistry of salt, Mr. Christ, whose first name is Jesus, then says he's moving on to physics, talking about the properties of light, after which there's a history lesson, and finally he'll end up with a bit of sociology. So you realize that he's planning to cover a lot in this one class. And what I'm hoping is by the end of this class that we will see how the chemistry of salt and the physics of light are connected with the history of the law and the prophets and ultimately with the sociology of the church, which includes you and I if we're in Christ. Now, this passage continues straight on from uh, last week's section on the Beatitudes, also known as the Blessed Bees. And if you remember, we talked about how the blessed life, the happy life, starts with spiritual poverty, not with body positivity, but with spiritual, po- spiritual poverty. And it ends with being ready to be persecuted, being ready to lay down your life for Christ. But, you know, the good news of, of Jesus is that right from the get-go to the one who realizes that their spirit is poor, you've only just started on that journey. As soon as you realize that your spirit is poor, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Now with uh, chemistry and physics and history and sociology ahead of us, we'd better get moving. Class is in session. First is the chemistry. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Matthew 5, 13. Like I already said, sodium chloride does not break down. It's stable. In other words, it does not lose its taste. Salt does not lose its taste. So there's a couple of options how to read this. First, Mr. Christ or Jesus might be referring to something called gypsum, which looks like salt but it's not salt you see in the olden days what they would do is they take salt from the shores of the dead sea to use for flavoring food or preserving food and in the process of collecting the salt they'd also accidentally collect gypsum um, which looks like salt but is actually flavorless if this is the case then maybe jesus is warning his classroom of disciples against appearing to be salty, but in fact turning out to be nothing more than gypsum. In other words, don't be fake, be the real thing. That's one way to understand this. Another way to interpret these words is if Jesus is actually pointing out the absurdity of the idea of salt losing its flavor. 
as in it's never going to happen. If the salt should lose its taste, then it's thrown out. So maybe at this point, Jesus is actually throwing in a bit of absurdity, a bit of humor here. Because salt losing its flavor, because it's so stable, is a scientific impossibility. Now, I looked up on Quora, which is a website where you can go to ask questions. And I, and I looked up there, what are some things that are considered scientific impossibilities? And here are some examples from a guy called Rookie. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I can't verify these, but this is what Rookie said. Some examples of scientific impossibilities include to predict the position and the momentum of an electron simultaneously. That's a scientific impossibility. I guess you can do either one or the other, but you can't do both. Number two, to attain absolute zero temperature, you know, zero degrees Kelvin. That's a scientific impossibility. I know we felt that maybe we achieved that over the past week, but absolute zero is an impossibility. And the third one that uh, Rookie mentions is to travel faster than the speed of light. Now, he had others, but I didn't understand them, so I didn't want to make myself look like an idiot this morning. Now, uh, there's this other guy on Quora, uh, James Maynard, who gives his version of a scientific impossibility, and James Maynard says this, creating matter or energy out of nothing or making it completely disappear seems to be the best candidate for something which is scientifically impossible. So to update Jesus' words, maybe uh, using what James says here, is that, we, is, that, is that we might say this, you are the energy and matter of the universe. But if the energy and the matter should completely vanish, it's useless. It does no one any good. And if this is what Jesus is getting at, then, then that, that usually uh, salt or, or that unsalty salt is a scientific impossibility, then the message of this chemistry lesson seems to be that you are the salt of the earth. Start acting like it. Start bringing flavor into my kingdom. This is who you are. You cannot lose who you are, so start acting like it. Because here's, here, here's the only way that salt cannot flavor a meal, and that is if it's not applied to it, right? If the salt stays over there in the salt shaker and it's not shaken over the chips, then the chips are going to stay forever bland, even though the salt is technically there on the table with them. And so the job of the follower of Jesus is to shake themselves over the world, and to bring out the Christ flavors all around them. That was the chemistry lesson. Now let's move on to physics. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So Mr. Christ, substitute teacher, asks the class, what is light? So think about it. What is light? Any suggestions of what light is? You can speak out nice and loud if you think you know or, or you have a way of explaining what is light. What is light? Absence of darkness. Absence of darkness. Okay, awesome. Any other suggestions? You're the star pupil at the moment, Diane. Yeah. Radiation of energy. Radiation of energy. Okay, awesome. Kindness. Oh, okay, kindness. Okay, so, yeah. Moving away from the science to how it's applied, yeah. So we've got absence of darkness, we've got radiation of energy, we've got kindness. Anyone else? I see Kai's absolutely bursting to speak. You got nothing, okay. <laughs> you just looked eager, which is good. You know, always look eager if you're in class. Anyone else before we uh, look at an, uh, a definition? Yes, these lights on the ceiling. Yeah. Okay, so the lights are attached yeah, to the ceiling. Yeah, awesome. Love it. To help you see the dirt. Yes. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, well, if, well, again, Wikipedia, you, you are my Wikipedia this morning, but if we're to look at Wikipedia itself, they say, Wikipedia says this, and it's, uh, it's probably quite close to what Sean said, light or visible light is electromagnetic radiation that can be perceived by the human eye. Light is electromagnetic radiation that can be perceived by the 
human eye. Now, if you look at this picture, as you can see, there is a lot of electromagnetic radiation. There's a lot of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum that is invisible to the human eye. So way out here, you have radio waves, and it goes to microwaves, and to infrared, to ultraviolet, to x-rays, and then over to gamma rays. And here, this just tiny little sliver in the middle is, is the visible electromagnetic spectrum, which is light. And, and what this shows us is that whether we can see them or not, these are operational all the time but they're invisible. You, you need special equipment to see them. But light, which is the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, is the only part that we can see. And in a sense, God's kingdom is like the whole spectrum, right? God's kingdom is everything. God's kingdom is the gamma rays and the x-rays. It's everything. Is the ultraviolet light. He's working in so many different ways, in so many different places, beyond our imagination and sometimes even beyond our theological constraints. God is working in ways that are invisible and often maybe undetectable. In fact, one of next week's lectionary scriptures, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, says this, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and no human heart has even conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. This is the invisible electromagnetic spectrum. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And what this verse kind of says is that, in a way, God takes the invisible parts of the entire spectrum and he makes them visible to us as light through the Holy Spirit. And then it's our job to shine this light into a dark world. Like our passage says, you are the light of the world. First, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then he says, you are the light of the world. You are the rainbow colors. You are the visible light representing the full glory of the mystery and the invisibility of God. Isn't that incredible? This is what you are, class. And the thing is, is that the un unregenerate heart cannot see God. Without the eyes of faith, we cannot see God. But if you've been transformed by Jesus, then your job is to make him seen. You are the light of the world, even in your soul poverty, like we talked about last week. Yours is the kingdom of heaven, and you shine the glorious, viewable, and visible colors of this invisible kingdom to anyone who is paying attention. That's the physics lesson done. Now for a bit of history. Verse 17. Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Okay, now this kind of feels like a bit of a break in Jesus' teaching flow, what's known as a non sequitur. But it's not. It makes sense. Okay, and to work that out, all we have to look at is the larger flow of, of what we've experienced. You see, at the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus paints this spectrum of blessing, also known as the Beatitudes. And the blessing started and ended with, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So earth is being painted as a realm under enemy rule, and Jesus is re-establishing his realm. And so here, Jesus is clearly talking, because we can see the context of chapter 5, Jesus is talking about kingdom living, the kingdom of heaven. And then we see just how this realm or this kingdom expands. What are the mechanics for the expanding of this kingdom? And it's through the subjects of Jesus Christ, through the citizens of Jesus' kingdom, by living out their nature of salt, by being salty, and by living out their nature of light, by being luminescent. This is how the kingdom expands. And so these next few verses are Jesus' way of saying that until the kingdom comes in full, until salt is shaken over the whole earth and until the entire universe glows with his light, the law and the prophets still have value. They still apply. They aren't just ancient history. They actually form the constitution of God's kingdom. You see, folks, 
today tend to split the Bible into two. You know, you have the Old Testament, which is the Law and the Prophets, and then you have the New Testament, which is Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the spread of the church. And we can be tempted to throw away the old stuff, but Jesus says, let's, let's not throw away the baby with the bathwater. And this actually takes us on to our sociology part of our lesson. Well, Jesus was on earth. He kept the law and the prophets absolutely perfectly, right? He lived out uh, God's rules without breaking one of them. Uh, He kept all of the Ten Commandments. He kept all of the Torah. And because Jesus kept the Ten Commandments and the Torah, we don't have to. Law keeping is not the way into the kingdom. You know, the way into the kingdom, as we learned last week, is to start by admitting that you're so poor, that you have nothing, that, that, that you are, that you are a, a pauper, that, that you, you are in, in the midst of soul poverty. But then once we're in the kingdom, once we enter in, into the kingdom through soul poverty, we then live out the Ten Commandments in obedience to Christ, right? And the logic is this, is that if the king chooses to live this way, then so do his subjects. Once again, keeping the law does not save us. It's only grace through faith. But then the law is the constitution that we come under while we wait for the kingdom to come in full, while we're in that um, kind of in-between times. While we're waiting between Jesus's first coming and second coming, the law is the is the constitution that we come under, which is why Jesus says this in verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of the letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished, Matthew 5, 18. Then once heaven and earth pass away, then the law will pass away because we won't need the law because our natures will be completely renewed. But until then, the law and the prophets help us to remember what is what while we're still fighting with the old nature and our desire to do things the old way. So the history that Jesus lived out the law and the prophets now becomes our sociology. It's the foundation of the, of the society of the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And I think this first part is kind of telling us, you know, there's a lot of revision happening in the church at the moment. And some of it's good and some of it is um, should should maybe give us pause for thought and and concern and why we have to be cautious about about what we acknowledge and what we accept and what is now considered okay is that here it says that whoever breaks one of these commandments and teaches others others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven interestingly it looks like this isn't a salvation issue okay so we can have divergent views on a number of things but we have to be careful what we are, what we are preaching and what we're accepting because um, we will be held accountable. And me as a pastor, I, I will be held accountable uh, more so than many. Now, in the sociology part of this lesson, there's a lot that I could say. We could revisit the Torah. We could look at the first five books of the Bible. We could ask of every single rule which is in the Torah, does this apply now? And if it does, should it apply literally or should it be more of a in-spirit application? Now, we won't do that, but Jesus knows that we have a tendency towards being Pharisees, right? Meaning, we don't know how to navigate this, so let's make a bunch of rules so we don't screw up, right? That's kind of what the Pharisees did. And he knows that we have that tendency in our lives. In fact, the Pharisees created over 600 rules to make sure that they didn't break the Ten Commandments, right? And I think at the beginning, probably the Pharisees' intentions were good, but by Jesus' time, the life of the Pharisee was a whole load of legalism that they then tried to foist onto other people. If you want to be a good Jew, then you have to do this, that, or the other. And it just robbed the joy and sucked the soul out of everyone. 
And Jesus knew this, which is why towards the end of Matthew, chapter 22, Jesus tells us what it's actually like to fulfill the law and the prophets. He doesn't leave it up to our imagination. And this is important because if the law and the prophets are the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, then we need to get it right. So let's look at Matthew chapter 22 and as Jesus tells us how to live out the law and the prophets. It says this, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together and one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command is the law which command in the law is the greatest? He said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Then what does he say? He says this, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And praise be to Jesus that he loved the Lord, his God, with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And on the cross, Jesus proved that he loved his neighbor as himself. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He didn't abolish them. He fulfilled them. He perfectly kept them because he knew that we couldn't. And then he invites us, fueled by the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father, to live out the sociology of the kingdom of heaven on the kingdom of earth. He invites us to start creating a brand new society in the place where we live, built on the foundation of complete love for him and complete love for each other. And this is how we become the salt of the earth and this is how we become the light of the world this is how we make the invisible god visible now as we wrap up this morning i want to revisit this idea of light that light is the visible part of the invisible electromagnetic spectrum and to do this i want us to imagine that we live in a first century ancient near east house there's no electricity, but you have a candle and it's placed quite high in the house so that it can shine light over as much of the house as it's able to, which would most likely have been one or two rooms. And this is what verse 15 is, is talking about. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand and it gives light for all who are in the house. Now, these Candles are high up and they're kind of shining into the house, but they're also shining out of the house through the windows. Now, imagine that there's a street of houses with candles in the windows. Okay, can you imagine that? Now imagine a subdivision of streets of houses with candles in the windows. Now imagine a city of subdivisions of streets of houses with candles placed high in the house, in the windows. And it might start to look like a Coldplay concert with everyone with their phones on, or if you're old enough with your lighters, right? It looks something like that. It's an impressive sight. And verse 14 of our passage says that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden, as you can see. Okay, so... Imagine now that you're in first century Palestine and you're traveling home towards Jerusalem and you're exhausted. It's been a long journey. It's nighttime. And then you crest one of the surrounding hills and you see this glorious city made up of subdivisions and streets and houses with candles. You cannot miss it. It cannot be hidden. It cannot be hidden. But now imagine if you crest that same hill And you're expecting to see the thousands of pinpricks of light to welcome you home. But this time, all you see are black shadows, not one light. You you can barely even make out the shape of the rise on which Jerusalem is situated. And you can't see hardly anything. It's vague. It's dark. It's like a big lump of darkness. And you might say, to all intents and purposes, that city on a hill is now hidden. You're starving for what Jerusalem has to offer, that light, but all you see is blackness. And then you start to feel anxious or uncertain. Is there anyone home? 
Are you welcomed? Maybe you came at a bad time. You wonder whether you should carry on to Jerusalem or maybe you should turn around and go back the way that you came. So the question class is, what did it take for that city that cannot be hidden in verse 14 to become a city that is hidden? All it took was for each resident of that city to do the unthinkable, to hide their lamp under a basket. And when they hide their lamp under a basket, they lose their glow. But that's rather silly. You know, you think people don't hide their lamps under a basket. Are you sure? Are you sure that this isn't true of you? You know, let's say that someone does hide their candle under a basket. Now, in spite or other than the obvious fire hazard, what else might happen? Well, if that lamp, if that candle is hidden under a basket, then eventually it's starved of oxygen and the candle goes out. Or to use the language of physics, that small part, that small visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum has become invisible which means that the whole thing is now invisible to the naked eye. You can see nothing of the electromagnetic spectrum. If we're not shining, if we're not glowing, if we turn out our lights, then vast spectrums of the, of the kingdom of heaven is now impossible for people outside of the kingdom to see. But thankfully, as our text says, a city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. Why? Why cannot a city situated on a hill cannot be hidden? The next verse explains. Because no one hides a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. And Jesus is saying that people aren't stupid enough to light a lamp and immediately hide it, right? If you do that, then you may as well not light the lamp in the first place. But Jesus says to us, and he says to his disciples, he says, your candle is lit. Okay, you are the light of the world. In other words, when you're part of God's family, when you've knelt and repented at the foot of the cross and experienced redemption and justification and forgiveness of sins, when you've been given new life, when you've been transformed by the Holy Spirit, something happens to you on a molecular spiritual level and you start to glow. And to mix our metaphors, you also start to become salty. You start to make the world around you taste good. In chemistry, salt or sodium chloride cannot lose its saltiness. The only way it can lose its taste is if it stays in the salt shaker because there's no one to taste it. Same as, right, if a tree falls in the forest, there's no one to see it, you know, Uh, or no one to hear it has it made a sound, right? This is kind of what we're seeing here. And in physics, the electromagnetic spectrum is always there, but if that light is turned off, then the whole spectrum is now rendered invisible because the visible part is unseeable. So what does it take for us to be, to shine and to be salty? Verse 16 tells us, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works This is the key, and give glory to your Father in heaven. See your good works. See your good works. Good works is the light shining. Positive actions done in a selfless way reveals the goodness of God, and it brings him glory. And I know, and I've experienced over this past week, that many of you are doing this. This week, I've witnessed good works. I've witnessed people coming to me and asking how they can help others. I've seen generosity. I've seen kindness. I've been the messenger boy for a number of you. I've seen people going out of their way. I've seen the light that you guys are shining. And because of your visible light, I can glorify the Father who is in heaven. But I know that some of you are holding back because you're afraid of standing out. Or making someone else feel awkward. No one wants, especially Canadians, no one wants to make a Canadian feel awkward. But could you put that aside? And could you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven? After all, it's not about you, right? It's about Him. 
So this week, I encourage you to ask God for an opportunity to shake yourself out of the salt shaker, to bring the flavor of life to someone else's life and to let your, your light shine, to do something simple or maybe even something really, really profound, something unexpected, something sacrificial for someone to let them know that God loves them. Because the only way for them to experience the full spectrum of the invisible mystery of, of our good God is through your visible light. It might not make sense, but do it anyways. Make the invisible God visible. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that uh, science points to you, that chemistry points to you, that history points to you, that sociology points to you, Lord, that uh, we can learn incredible lessons from these things that are around us and that we maybe take for granted often. So, Lord God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would show them how to lift the basket off their lamp and that they can put it high in the house so it can shine out of the window and it can lead a lonely traveller home. Lord, I pray that, uh, that, uh, that we would not be so afraid of being proud or having some false view of humility that we never do anyone any good, but that we would actually bite the bullet and that we would... Uh, we would extend ourselves and uh, we would let our good works shine. Because that is how the invisible God is made visible. Lord, I, I, I pray that you would speak what that thing is to each of my brothers and sisters. That you would help them to know what it is that you are calling them to do over this next week to make your kingdom visible all of the multicolors lord our li life without you is drab life without you lord god is monochrome life without you is bland but lord god when 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 you shake us out of the salt shaker there's flavor and when lord god we lift that basket off that lamp there is light and there's so many people in our community who need to know that you exist and that's through us lord i ask this in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen, amen.
Oh, okay.